Oh, Connor, let's talk about this Gareth article because it is very, very important where he is like just kind of explaining how the media coverage of this uh, has started, I, I think, to really influence the American public perception of ending the Afghan war. So uh, go ahead. Let, let's talk about Gareth's great article. It's uh, published yeah. at the Gray Zone. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, so Gareth talks about, you know, he's got a quote, the way he opens this and he's got, he, I, he, Gareth is usually right. I mean, uh, he's one of my favorite reporters, but just the way he said this, it struck me in the beginning. He goes in the wake of a remarkably successful town ban offensive cap by the takeover of Kabul, the responses of corporate media provided what may have been the most dramatic demonstration ever of its fealty to the Pentagon and military leadership. And that, I just mean that one line struck me because you know, I, I rarely watch mainstream media, but during after the fall of Kabul, I found myself out of curiosity flipping on the TV to see what, you know, Fox News, for instance, was doing. And it's just I mean, it was such an intense barrage of propaganda. And really, I mean, it's been said uh, by people, especially in the libertarian community uh, in, in our world, that that they are seem to be making this withdrawal, which is ultimately obviously a very good thing as painful as possible in terms of the coverage. And so, you know, he talks about how that uh, one of the things that they've been harping on, and, and we'll get to some examples, uh, chiefly uh, David Sanger and Helen Cooper in the New York Times, but they're talking about how Mark Milley, the joint chair, the chairman of the joint staff, who, by the way, came out, I forgot, neglected to mention, and said, uh, he goes, oh, um, I think we got one ISIS K guy in there in that attack in Kabul, which there's absolutely that that bombing of those uh, that f those families in Kabul. That there's no evidence of that as of yet, um, and nothing seems to be pointing in that direction. But he had the nerve to come out and say that. Um, he goes, and uh, others were killed. But anyway, it turns out this guy was uh, this guy was making a huge push against Biden to keep 4,500 troops indefinitely in Afghanistan, and. Um, it looks like, I mean, again, and this might have been a real reason why Biden, you know, we assumed it was all this pressure from the Pentagon, especially, you know, that it took him so long to make the decision ultimately. It wasn't until I think the middle of April. And uh, so he talks about how the they had the media advancing arguments that they that the military couldn't make themselves and it gave them cover, especially in the face of such a disastrous failure. So uh, he goes, uh, so the, 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 the first article that came out as a part of this sort of media attack was uh, from David Sanger and Helen Cooper at the New York Times. And the Beltway, uh, he goes, uh, they begin by acknowledging, yes, the U.S. military overestimated the results of the intervention for years. And, and yes, the Afghan government's inability to fund their own security forces sapped the will of some of the uh, resistance to the Taliban. However, then they start hammering Biden for his refusal to keep troops indefinitely in the country per Milley's request. Um, and they say that he was trying to get three to four, uh, four, three thousand to forty five hundred troops in the country. And of course, as usual, you know, they cite intelligence estimates that predict that in two or three years, Al Qaeda will find a new foothold in Afghanistan. And so, uh, you know, Gareth goes through and very briefly debunks the, you know, the the whole nonsense that you were just al actually uh, alluding to earlier. I mean, this stuff about well, ISIS and the Taliban, you know. Who maybe ISIS is going to form an alliance with that? You know, all this kind of thing is um, really part of a, a an extensive history of the hawks conflating the Taliban with Al Qaeda and 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 sort of Osama bin Laden, and uh, for the purposes of the war on terror. And uh, it, there's there's a set, almost there's no truth to. It. I mean, I I get annoyed when they say you know, he harbor they harbored Al Qaeda. They. I, I can't go through the, all the history right now, but they they had they offer they were in talks with uh, for years after the embassy attacks uh, in East Africa between then and 9/11 with U.S. officials. They even offered to have Bin Laden assassinated. They gave him so many chances. I mean, even Milton Bearden, Bearden the former uh, CIA uh, station chief in Afghanistan from the Operation Cyclone, said that they were giving them all kinds of signals. He's no longer in our supervision. Just basically go out and kill him. Uh, they hated him, especially Mullah Omar hated bin Laden. But yeah, we're just seeing more of that. Uh, and of course, he also makes a point that they have especially even more of an interest now in ensuring that uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS-K uh, do not 
establish any kind of a real uh, presence in Afghanistan, especially, you know, look at I mean, like I just mentioned, they don't want to have any of these issues with China or Russia uh, either, uh, in addition to any sort of potential attack on America and the sort of safe haven myth. But then he says that then they interview David Petraeus, of all people, the great American fraud, as Scott Horton would say. Uh, and he says this is echoing what your coverage of Max Boot. He goes. Uh, he says Biden failed to recognize the risk incurred by the swift withdrawal of intelligence drones and close air support. And here you go. The contractors who kept the Afghan Air Force flying as if this is all of a sudden an issue who you know, whose fault is this exactly? Because last time I checked the so even if you first of all, I don't really the idea that that this is some disaster because there's not going to be some protracted war after we leave where we can continue to fund the Afghan the Potemkin regime in Kabul uh, in, in a war with the Taliban there and they took power in a minimal in a coup de main with minimal casualties that's not really a catastrophe as far as I'm concerned um, uh, but you know they're saying that you know it's it's too bad that we don't have they pulled out the contractors and that was the problem and they also cite uh the chief executive of CNAS who says roughly the same thing this guy Richard Fontaine and CNAS of course is behind the Afghan surge uh you know Michelle Flor and I founded the think tank and we're going to get to her in a minute too but uh yeah no they they're basically saying that it's Biden's fault that this all happened because he pulled the contractors out well the contractors wouldn't be necessary if Congress didn't step in i believe during the Trump uh, administration and say that the Afghan government had to buy American helicopters and Black Hawk helicopters because the old they can't be buying the old Soviet helicopters, which they were able to maintain themselves. They had to get these helicopters, which are not nearly as capable. And they, as soon as we started pulling out uh, on any real level after May 1st, uh, most of these helicopters uh, were grounded and the Afghan government wasn't able to provide air support to their commandos uh, and reinforcements never came that were promised to these guys in the field. And oftentimes, I mean, it wasn't, it like I said, and min there were minimal casualties, but there were instances where in these commandos who were defending districts who thought that uh, you know, reinforcements were coming. They were just, you know, sometimes half of them would be slaughtered by the Taliban and then they, the rest of them would give up because they'd realize that, yeah, that we're not, you can't count on anything uh, here. Um, and so, um, yeah, then he talks about how in foreign policy, the, uh, they interviewed a bunch of people on August 16th. So this is um, after uh, Kabul fell. He says they interviewed a bunch of, you know, foreign and current diplomats who said, we are just, uh, they anonymously said deep anger, shock and bitterness is how we it basically is how we feel about the collapse of the government. We spent decades trying to build, uh, which is just laughable, uh, you know, 20 trillion dollars, hundreds of thousands of people killed. And uh, and and the thing collapsed in 11 days. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, oh, but you're really sound. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, all the hard work. And um, they say that they, the current people were threatening that they would resign in protest, citing an overwhelming sense of guilt and fear for the lives of their former Afghan colleagues and local staff whom the American government is leaving behind. And, you know, of course, we heard about this uh, uh, constantly in different iterations throughout the media and even the independent media, especially on the right. You heard a lot of people, you know, just basically attacking Biden for leaving, uh, you know, our allies behind and all this kind of thing. And um, then Robin Wright at The New Yorker, this is pretty good. She says that this is a dishonorable – you know, she's complaining that our standing is being uh, lessened in the world and that this is dishonorable. And uh, she laments that the U.S. is engaged in what historians may someday call a great retreat from a ragtag army that has no air power. But it's like, yeah, how do you not even realize when you're writing that that this was a totally wrong – this was – the worst policy is, like you said, I mean, this is Bin Laden's policy. It bog us down in a quagmire. We can't win, and we just bleed ourselves to bankruptcy. This is more than $2 trillion. We've reordered our entire society, and uh, we're trillions of dollars in debt. We have all this mass surveillance, uh, you know, torture prisons, including in, Af uh, in Afghanistan during the war. And you're talking— and the idea that they would say that they were, they, you know, we, yes, we did. We lost to the Taliban. We lost to the Pashtuns. Uh, 
and and the idea that this is where I'm supposed, you know, it's I always feel like they're trying to bull. I guess this is meant for more the intellectual class and the uh, the politicians and the so-called thought leaders or whatever. But I do feel like if you look at the mainstream news, they kind of do the same thing to the American people, who rightfully so have this Afghanistan syndrome as it's being called. But they're being bullied into, you know, you should feel weak and pathetic and shameful of all of this. You know, for not supporting and continuing the policies. She and she goes, This is part of an unnerving American pattern dating back to the seventies. And again, that's would be the Vietnam syndrome. She goes, It starts with Reagan's pullout from Beirut and Obama's withdrawal from Iraq in two thousand eleven. And she claimed the Taliban has won a key battle against democracy in Afghanistan and the country will almost certainly become a safe haven for like minded militants, uh, be they members of Al Qaeda or others in search of a sponsor. Of course, leaning on that old propaganda I'd referenced earlier. Right, right. Hilarious when uh, there was no democracy in Afghanistan. Fake yeah. elections are not elections. Uh, if, you know, they th thought democracy was under attack in America, at least, you know, a, a good number of the eligible voters showed up to vote and polling sites weren't blown up on the day. And Trump didn't swear himself in at the same time as the president like we had in Afghanistan. But uh, what else is in this Gareth article? Oh, yeah. So he, he talks about how uh, there was this uh, uh, PBS panel, uh, uh, let's see, on Washington Week with Peter Baker of the New York Times and Giran of the Washington Post and Vivian Salma of the Wall Street Journal. And he says that they they basically blame the the all the chaos at Kabul airport and all the uh, Afghans uh, seeking um, you know escape uh, and the chaos that ensued as uh, basically blaming Biden for the hasty withdrawal and this sort of thing. And Gareth makes the point that. Uh, and I, I thought this was good because the implicit and clearly fanciful premise of the discussion was that the United States could have somehow embarked weeks or months earlier on a sweeping program to rescue tens and possibly hundreds of thousands of interpreters and other collaborators with the U.S. military and that it could all be done cleanly and efficiently without triggering any panic. You know, I mean, how, how do you do that? You tell all these people that essentially like you got to get out of here because you all might die but keep it on the dl would you because we don't want to you know how, how how would you organize something like that but um yeah no i mean they're just again i like i said i think it's it's more about bullying the american people they could have expedited as doug bondo talks about they could have expedited and and fixed the uh the visa uh process that was broken uh, and they obviously should have gotten started on this as soon as he came into office. But again, these people are running and carrying or running cover and carrying water for the military who were trying to sabotage this all along during both uh, administrations. And, um, you know, he says uh, Peter Baker of The New York Times. This is really shameful. The guy says, uh, you know, well, Biden made up his mind a decade ago that the U.S. must withdraw with from Afghanistan. He was determined to do it regardless of what General Milley and others warned him about the danger of a collapse. Um and uh, yeah, so then the worst example is uh, they interviewed Michelle Flournoy, who should not be asked about what she thinks about anything, but is unfortunately a very powerful foreign policy apparatchik, uh, especially given her history in the Obama administration and sort of in the Democratic Party's foreign policy establishment. She, I would, I would characterize her as a neocon, although ideologically she might not fill every box. But this is a woman who has suggested that we should uh, – her think – let's put it this way. Her think tank CEO formerly was Victoria Newland, And uh, she has said that we need to uh, be able to destroy the entire Chinese civilian merchant military fleet in 72 hours uh, in the event of a war with them. And uh, – yeah, so she, you know, has her name. She has her byline over the disastrous Afghan surge that tripled the war and killed tens of thousands of people and only made the Taliban stronger. Um, and she uh, came out, and they, this guy uh, Greg Jaff in the Washington Post interviews her, and she says, uh, you know, basically he he uh, he admits, you know, he goes, he acknowledges that the war was, as Garrett says, an abject failure. Uh, but he interviews her for her, you know, her perspective and she comes out and she says essentially the problem with the whole, uh, mission and that she wasn't aware of this until after the surge was that it turns out the Afghan government was corrupt. The people that we empowered, the warlords, uh, they were just, uh, unreliable and, um, what'd she say? Uh, uh, what'd she say? Our democratic ideals were not sustainable or workable in the Afghan context, sort of blaming the Afghan people, but saying that uh, 
let's see, we had a big bet. We had made a big bet only to learn that our local partner was rotten. And uh, basically saying that, uh, you know, our democratic, uh, our liberal democratic ways are just not workable in a backwards place like Afghanistan. And we just didn't realize that the people that we had empowered, people like Rashid Dostum, were, uh, you know, corrupt and, you know, a guy who murders people in uh, shipping containers uh, and, uh, you know, is it just has been a war criminal general for decades. Yeah, we uh, we just uh, you, yeah, who, who would have known that? But this is the guy that we allied with immediately after we went into Afghanistan in the beginning of 2001. And so, uh, you know, uh, Gareth points out that that's just simply not true. So Amnesty International was documenting as early as 2003 that the warlord militiamen who we had empowered as police in places around Afghanistan in these different provinces were extorting money from local families by abduct abducting and raping their wives, daughters, and sons. Uh, he says, you know, that these they were, you know, these militia police were they maintained their loyalty to the warlords. Uh, uh, and were not loyal to any civilian government cobble. They were given a free hand to steal from Afghans, falsely accuse them of crimes and torture them, and then release them only for a ransom. And he talks about, he gives an example of how in Helmand province in 2005, 2006, the Taliban took over and were, had popular support because the people were sick of these warlord militias out, you know, killing people and torturing people. And when the Americans came back in in 2009, they came back and they reoccupied these areas. Uh, they, uh, they essentially, um, from large parts of Helmand province, I should say, they came back and they occupied those areas again and re-empowered those militias. And immediately they went back to raping preteen boys and committing all kinds of atrocities. And so the, the Afghan population, uh, of Helmand province in these parts were telling the Americans that you better stop or we're going to start supporting the Taliban. But of course uh, the Americans never did that. They never, uh, dropped their alliance with these kinds of of murderers and war criminals. And so, again, this was all on record as uh, anybody who was reading antiwar.com would have known uh, that, the, the, and, and, you know, and, and any good reporting at the time that this was, these people, you did not have popular support. And it's very obvious. I mean, the whole thing went down literally like a house of cards. And, um, but yeah, no, Michelle Flournoy wants us to believe that the problem is that the Afghan people just don't have de the democracy in them to, to, you know, see the job through. All right, Connor, I guess that 